going to introduce uh, Michael Brian Brown. He's the president of Green Mountain Technologies, and he's going to talk to us about the impacts of new phosphorus regulations on composting of animal manures. Here's okay. your clicker. And uh, this slide forward, slide back, the arrows? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Great. All right, yes, I'm Michael Brian Brown, uh, and uh, I'm a, not a soil scientist. Uh, I'm a civil environmental engineer. So I'm, I'm going to venture into some soil uh, chemistry and dynamics with phosphorus that are well, uh, well outside of my education. But so if I uh, misstep, I know there's a lot of people who have studied pea in a big way uh, at this conference. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do my best with it. And uh, in Green Mountain Technologies, we're a company that is uh, uh, a composting company. So our philosophy is uh, everything's better with compost, or composting something makes it better. And uh, so we uh, got involved with uh, manure management, of course, because it's one of the options that is a number of our clients are manure producers, and they're looking to compost uh, to improve their product, get a higher dollar value out of the manures. And so uh, the compost industry has a similar struggle that the uh, animal manure industry has, which is uh, it is phosphorus heavy in relation to uh, nitrogen content. And so we've done a fair amount of work on looking at uh, trying to find ways to balance the amount of nitrogen that's available in a compost product versus uh, phosphorus. And so with, uh, has this got a pointer on it? Guess not. Uh, so. One of the uh, so I've read a fair amount on the um, on the balance relationship between N and P uh, in terms of uh, what the plants require and also what was uh, typically available in the environment. And one of the uh, interesting papers I'll I'll talk a little bit about the the uh, N cycle. So uh, anthropogenic generation of N. The, the this paper theorized that actually uh, in freshwater systems P is considered the limiting nutrient now. Uh, but they said historically, before the anthropogenic generation of, uh, of N, that uh, nitrogen was actually the limiting nutrient for almost all systems, not only salt water and fresh water. And so I thought that was very interesting that, uh, that the, the current atmospheric deposition of, of nitrogen in soils has actually uh, pushed freshwater systems into being P limited. And so we, we got involved more in this whole process. Uh, through the um, state of Maryland, uh, so started issuing a, um, uh, a PMT model, so for trying to limit the amount of phosphorus being discharged in the Chesapeake. And so they started uh, looking at regulating uh, the amount of phosphorus that could be applied to um, agricultural lands, which is a good thing. We're all in support of uh, trying to uh, improve the water quality in Chesapeake Bay. But there was one particular part of the, uh, of the regulation. So in their PMT model, which they are now instituting, I could, let me back up a little bit to show. Uh, right now, they uh, just instituted the first phase of their uh, phosphorus regulation for, the, for Maryland. And so they identified the highest risk areas. And uh, they're now starting to uh, require that all those uh, ag land are now, are now uh, required to uh, meet the PMT model. And so uh, they're, they're starting to be able, they're limited on the amount of uh, phosphorus that can be applied to that land. And so that's going to phase in. And over time, by 2022, it would apply to uh, all farms with high phosphorus. So right now, in terms of a, a compost market, that's really not being limited substantially, but by 2022, it could start impacting the ability of composters to be able to market their product. So the, the beef that we had with the state of Maryland was that the, uh, the categories that they considered in their PMT model, which was done by the University of Maryland, that's a nice, nice piece of work, but uh, they lumped together uh, uh, chemical fertilizers, manures, compost, or biosolids. And our perspective was, well, maybe the biosolids, and, or maybe the compost in particular, uh, wouldn't have as much availability because uh, the P would be biologically bound. And so we actually applied to the state of Maryland for a, uh, an AWTF, or the Animal Waste Technology Fund grant, and 
they uh, granted us $300,000 to do research to see if, this, if that theory was actually true. Like I say, we believe everything's better if you compost it. Um, let's test it out. So uh, we uh, got a grant to install systems at two farms. And uh, first farm was uh, Day's End uh, Horse Rescue Farm, which is a, really an amazing institution. They uh, go out and, and they uh, take in horses that have been uh, neglected or abused, and then they, they rehabilitate them. So it's a great mission. Uh, it's all, almost all volunteer driven. And so we were looking uh, in particular for this particular site, uh, taking the manure from their, from their stalls, running through a composting process, and then doing analysis on that compost, but also then reusing that same uh, composted manure back in their stalls. And then the uh, second site we did was, uh, this was in Frederick County in Maryland, and it was called Glamour View Dairy. It was a brand new dairy, state of the art, uh, had uh, robotic milking, uh, solar panels on the roof, uh, it was, had received several different uh, grant fundings from the state of Maryland already. And we uh, installed our earth flow composting system also there. So this, this vessel was uh, 12 feet wide, 50 feet long. And the primary focus for this, for this facility was to, to uh, compost their dry pack manure from their heifer barns. So the way the, uh, the earth flow system works, it's a plug flow vessel. And the reason I, I wanted to bring that particular point up is when we did our experimental design, we started out working with the um, USDA. We're going to do the lab analysis and, and the uh, demonstration of whether the composting process was actually tying up the pee or not. And so uh, we, uh, it's a plug flow process. And so uh, one of the things we learned is that doing in situ uh, field experimentation is extremely hard to be able to control variables. It's one thing to have a concept about what you think is going to happen and you bring it into the field and then, then it turns out there's so many, uh, so many variables you can't control and you get your data back and you're like, well, Christ, that didn't do anything about what we were anticipating was going to happen. And so one of the variables that uh, were, were thrown into this process was it's a plug flow. So what we were doing is we were sampling at the load end, which is our raw, raw manure, and then we're sampling at the discharge end. We're looking at, okay, what's the, what's the trend of, um, of the nutrients from one end of the vessel to the other? And it sounds pretty simple, but just the, what we found was just the daily variability and the characteristics of the manure uh, and the fact that it was all getting blended together really threw uh, a lot of um, uh, unknowns into the process. And so our data sets started uh, being a lot more random than we'd like them to be. So the uh, so for bedded horse manure, the trends were that uh, this is the the uh, average of of uh, four sampling events. They the experimental design uh, they wanted to see what was happening in all four seasons. So we did sampling in the summer, fall, winter, and spring. And so in the summer, this is uh, just uh, one of the data sets. I didn't I put up a lot of data. Just so we, there's a fair amount of data in the report. So if you guys want to see more of the data, uh, the data is available in the, um, in the submission. And so the, uh, the variability, we didn't see a lot of the trending that we wanted to see. So in the case of, uh, of, of phosphorus, the actual level of phosphorus went up. Now, it the, uh, the, uh, doesn't really necessarily go to the issue of, uh, of uh, water extractable phosphorus, but the, the amount of phosphorus actually went up. And that could be explained by the fact that during the process, we're breaking down, we're, we're removing moisture, and uh, we're volatilizing ammonia, and we're breaking down carbon, and that's being removed from the process. So on a weight basis, all those other ingredients are reducing while uh, P is more or less staying the same. So that guy actually could make sense. So when we looked at that N to P ratio, uh, our nitrogen did go down substantially but our uh, P wasn't changing substantially. So this is uh, the data, like I said, for the, for the uh, load and the unload side. Uh, we weren't seeing a significant trend on the, on the nitrogen. And in one case, the nitrogen was actually was higher on the discharge end than it was on the load end. 
And so we weren't uh, effectively controlling the process well enough. And if we, uh, we had one other complicating factor, which was we began this process in the uh, summer of 2016, and in the fall it was a presidential election, and then there was a major reshuffling of the USDA budget, and uh, the, the researcher we were working with lost her funding to continue to support this project. So we actually had to uh, switch over to a different lab and get different data. So if you look back at this data set, uh, you can see that some of the uh, constituents that were actually tested were, were different, and, and so that threw another le level of variability into the process. And so, the, uh, so once again, the, the uh, P didn't show any, any clear trend either in the data. And then wa water extractable uh, phosphorus uh, didn't uh, show a clear trend. It, there was a slight trend that you might be able to take on the, um, on the unload side in relation to the load end. So water extractable uh, data looked a little more promising. So then, uh, as I said, we did, the, uh, we did the same data analysis for in the spring, and we got a much clearer trend uh, in, the string, in the spring for water extractable phosphorus. So uh, this, this data, actually, we switched over to John Spargo at Penn State, and he did this uh, water extractable P testing for us. So the, uh, the spring trends looked a little more promising, whether there is some aspect of a, a change in the characteristics of uh, dry pack manure when you're looking at uh, winter versus spring, or whether it was just our sampling process was better, it's not clear. And like I said, the variability in our uh, in the experiment really started throwing, uh, throwing wrenches in this whole process. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the other pieces that we've started working on in relation to looking at phosphorus, as I mentioned, that compost like manure is, is P heavy in relation to the um, the nitrogen availability. So we uh, developed, we've offered for the last um, 15 years a compost calculator to help our uh, people who are using our technology create balanced recipes. So they're making compost that has uh, enough nutrient available, not only for the process, dry the process so the bacteria can grow in the compost pile, but also there's enough N uh, available for, for plant production in the product. And so we, we decided uh, last year to actually add a uh, C to P calculator also. So looking at not only what, what feedstocks are important to put in to uh, get the right balance of C to N, but also to look at C to P. And that's much more driven because most of our ingredients are biologically based. They're fairly balanced in terms of having enough P available because they're basically you're degrading a life form in and building a new life form. So typically the uh, N to P ratios are fairly balanced. But when you get to your product, because we lose a lot of N in a compost process, you tend to go phosphorus heavy at the end. So we decided that we would build a, uh, a, an additional feature to our calculator that looked at um, the phosphorus level. So we uh, put together a feedstock library and, uh, the, well, let's see, I think I've covered most of these points already. Um, so, well, let me back that one up. So the, uh, what the uh, calculator does is it has a uh, feedstock library, and so it has about 50, 50 uh, ingredients of different types of uh, manures, yard wastes, and uh, other crop residuals, uh, that, and municipal waste, <laughs> all of those ingredients are categorized. And then we made an estimate, uh, or we re relied on lab data, so we made a de an estimate of the bulk density, the average moisture content, uh, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in each one of those ingredients. And uh, so some of the ingredients were, uh, there was data available. Other ingredients, uh, for instance, like cocoa shells, uh, there's, there's not a lot of uh, data out there. People do uh, analysis on the resultant compost materials, and I'd love to talk to Midwest uh, Labs a little bit more and see if they have feedstock data for any of these for P-levels, thank you. Uh, so the, um, 
so that we went out and, and did our best to find data to support the um, percentage of P in these ingredients. And so what you do is you build a, re a recipe. Uh, let's see if I've got a good example here. So uh, you, the way the calculator works is you go in and you select the feedstock you want to want to put in. So it's activated sludge. You select the um, the volume of material you're going to put in, and you can also take if you have like for an activated sludge, you typically have lots of lab data on your specific sludge. So you can go into the library and customize the the C to N ratio or percent nitrogen, percent phosphorus, uh, and moisture content. And then you uh, t you take in and you start adding your bulky materials, and then it it shows you over here in the dials how you know the relative uh, relationship of bulk density to moisture to C to N and C to P are all interacting. So it's a useful tool, especially for a composter who has a lot of different feedstocks that he brings into his facility. And let's see. So the yeah. So the net effect is that. At the end of it, you'll get a uh, you get a picture of how that how that mix is going to not only perform in the compost process, but it's what the resultant P is going to be like in the balance. So that's it. So I got time for questions. Yeah. Hi, well, uh, that's all really cool. Nice tool. Um, on your plug flow system, how, what was the retention time? So we uh, were working on a 21 day retention time. Okay. And so that was another aspect of the experimental design is that the uh, people I've talked to uh, about P chemistry uh, since, since we did the experiments were saying, well, you know, 21 days is really not uh, long enough to really see uh, a substantial result in the, the rate of, uh, of binding for phosphorus. And that, you know, the phosphorus being neither created nor destroyed in the process uh, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily change state substantially in 21 days. If you looked at something where you get more into a fungal process where the phosphorus could get more bound biologically, then you might see more, more of a difference. So really, that probably you should have looked at maybe a, a cured product as opposed to something that's just been through an active thermophilic phase. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, move the material? So the material is moved through that, uh, let's see if I can back up to a slide of it. There's an inclined auger that um, moves the material down the vessel. So this, this auger right here uh, is moving back and forth inside the vessel. And so twice a day, it, it's, it's moving and slowly pushing the material towards the back. So it's a single, single uh, mixing auger that also does uh, procession material. I have some print material up here if anybody's interested in seeing more about how the vessel works. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Yeah.